So now we go to a very different kind of architect, to Adolf Meyer. Uh, Adolf Meyer, who was the man in the shadow of Walter Grotius. He also died young and, uh, you know, rather young. And I think uh, because of it, uh, so he was, you know, uh, uh, 19 plus 29, uh, 48 years old uh, when he died. So he died before the Second World War. So Adolf Meyer, born June 17th, uh, was a German architect. But I don't know what they meant by architect because you'll see he actually didn't study architecture. A student and employee of Peter Barons, Meyer became the office boss of the firm of Walter Gropius around 1915. Well, he was already 34 and a full partner afterwards in 1919, Walter Gropius appointed Meyer as a master at the Bauhaus, where he taught work drawing and construction technique. Meyer is also accredited as co-designer of the Gropius entry for the 1922 Chicago Tribune Tower competition, and we are going to see their project. From 1926, he practiced as an architect in the new Frankfurt project. I don't know what the new Frankfurt project is, but I, 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 I end this presentation on him with a building he built for Frankfurt. Um, so he was Walter Gropius' right-hand man, his number one planner and a close confidant. In 1910, they had already worked together on the Fagus factory, one of the most significant buildings in modernist architecture. Uh, Walter Gropius had some kind of a genius for picking up uh, very talented and interesting uh, creative people and surround himself with. And um, maybe this was his greatest, uh, greatest ability and greatest, uh, greatest talent. As I said, uh, I read that Gropius didn't draw, so he always worked with someone else. He worked with Marcel Breuer, he worked with Adolf Meyer. In this case today, we talk about Adolf Meyer. This was the man. Now, <laughs> you know, in this picture, this uh, roll of paper probably is, uh, is uh, in a funny way, uh, insinuating itself almost like an earring for Adolf Meyer. Of course, it's not an earring, but, uh, uh, you know, the photographer probably didn't think of this. Uh, to me, at first, when I saw it, I thought, wow, you know, in 19, whatever, 1910, 1915, 1920, this man looks quite, uh, you know, uh, astonishingly contemporary because of that big uh, earring, which is not an earring. Of course, it's that uh, roll of paper there, a project, of course. Otherwise, he's quite elegant with, um, with a bow tie and a nice uh, woolen, uh, uh, you know, uh, tweed uh, suit, it seems. Anyway, so between 1895 and 1897, Adolf Meyer completed, oh no, he completed, no, no, he completed a two year apprenticeship with a cabinet maker. You know, uh, not an architecture school. He also received instruction in drawing. He then worked in the furniture workshops in Cologne, Krefeld, and Dusseldorf until 1901. From 1903, he attended the School of Applied Arts in Cologne. From 1904, um, so one year later, he studied at this Kunstgewerbe Schule in Dusseldorf under Peter Berens and Johannes Ludovicus Mateus Loverics. In 1907, Berens hired his former student to work in his studio in Berlin. Between 1909 and 1910, Meyer worked for Bruno Paul. The same year, Walter Gropius hired him as the office manager at his studio. This, this, this fact that Walter Gropius trusted young people and you know, gave them uh, positions of responsibility, again, shows the open-mindedness of Gropius. After all, he was the one who said an open mind works best like an umbrella when it is open. And he had himself, um, uh, I think, an open mind. This collaboration, which lasted until 1914, resulted in a number of important 20th century buildings 
such as the Fagusberg. This is a factory, and we are going to see it, uh, and an office building and factory for the Deutsche Werbund. You are going to see it too, an exhibition in Cologne in 1914. When Gropius practice closed down, Meyer became office manager for the steel construction company, you read the name, in Berlin. In 1919, Walter Gropius brought Adolf Meyer to the Stadtliche uh, Bauhaus Weimar, so to the first Bauhaus in Weimar, because he founded it in 1919 as an assistant for the architecture department. Well, the architecture department was just him, Gropius. There was no architect there teaching architecture. It was just him. And even him, uh, he probably didn't quite uh, qualify to be called an architect because he didn't also, uh, I don't know. I don't know how these people function at that time, but uh, you know, he also didn't, he studied a little bit, but he was the son of an architect. And anyway, he built something. Here he directed Gropius' private architecture office and taught technical drawing and construction from 1920 to 1925. Together with Walter Mark, he was the site manager for the house Am Horn, but it's not, uh, well, maybe the manager, but uh, the, the, the architect of the house Am Horn, which you are going to see, was George Muche, uh, who was an artist. In 1924, he was responsible for the compilation and typographic development of the book, a prototype house published by the Bauhaus Weimar as the third volume in the series of Bauhaus books. This was actually the, we are going to come, uh, to come back to this project. Now we start with a very interesting work from 1920. So it was, it was one year after Gropius founded, um, the Bauhaus in Weimar. And this house has nothing to do with what we imagine the Bauhaus style was about. Because the, the Bauhaus at the beginning was rather an arts and crafts movement to an extent, and it was uh, expressionistic and almost mystical. I mean, look at this house. If you see it, would you call it a Bauhaus house? Not really, no. Uh, this was done one year after Gropius founded the Bauhaus. And it was built together with Adolf Meyer, meaning he had certain ideas and Meyer drew them. And it's, it's you know, I mean, look, it's, it's in many ways, it's a traditional house, um, you know, built uh, in good measure with the traditional, uh, uh, processes and the materials and so on. And you see the details inside the house. This is not a modernistic house. So look at the interior, you know. I mean, this is not a, an international style interior. It's not. It's expressionistic, it's heavy, it's traditionalist, but it's nice. And look at, look at this again, a lot of ornamentation. Yes, a little bit abstracted, but this is heavy duty ornamentation within the house. Interesting building, interesting building. And I don't know exactly the role of Adolf Meyer, but he certainly had a role and maybe it was more, more, more than just drawing. I mean, who did this incision in the, in the door? You know, was it Gropius? I doubt it because he didn't draw. It's possible that, you know, it was Adolf Meyer who did it. But the idea to incise, a, a, especially an entrance door or a, a door into a, you know, a more so-called important space, it's important, I think, it's interesting because the door represents the transition, it's the threshold there between one space and the other. It shouldn't be just a blank, you know, surface. Although we are going to see at the end of this presentation, uh, some, some of those doors uh, in that house that they built uh, at, at the Bauhaus. I mean, even the plan of this house is not it's not revolutionary modern at all. Uh, 
even the table. And the only so-called modern thing is the, uh, you know, the surface of the table, but otherwise, just like these ornaments and uh, everything else is, is rather, well, look at the house. Now compare this house with the Charles Eames house or the Eames house. You can't. And the distance between them in terms of years is not so big, actually. Sorry for the resolution here. It shows this house and it's part of a poster with uh, expressionistic uh, uh, elements. Now we arrive at the truly the famous Pagus factory uh, in Altfeld, Altfeld that he built together with Walter Gropius. And it's a good work. Uh, it's a good work. It is a factory, but just compare this building with this building here. It's, it, it, it's, it's very well done. And I, 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 I like to think that again, Adolf, Adolf Meyer uh, was um, instrumental, not just in, in, in the implementation, the technical implementation of the building. It was, a, as, as I read, a confidant of uh, Walter Gropius. They were friends, they worked together. So there was more to it. And you saw the man with that uh, big uh, earring on his right uh, ear, you know. Of course, I'm joking, but uh, I, what I meant is that he probably had an artistic side too. Thanks to Arch Daily, I'm able sometimes to have many details of various buildings because they have, uh, they, they, they have this way of uh, presenting so-called uh, you know, classics, classic works of Arch Daily classics, um, very thoroughly. So it's just a factory, but the factory promoted a certain kind of aesthetics, which later on was reflected in other works. And it's a combination between the terrace, you know, and a sloping roof. And it, 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 it is a little bit uh, hybrid and a little bit ambiguous, uh, but uh, it's a quality, you know, that after all, this was built, uh, uh, you know, 100 years ago. And um, it still has a convincing uh, architectural language. I like these windows very much. I mean, I, also the photograph is beautiful. Just, just this photograph, you know, with the detail of these windows, which uh, which uh, rotate uh, in this way. I think it's a it's a brilliant uh, so-called detail. Very nice. And I'm sure Adolf, uh, Adolf Meyer had something to say here. The man in the shadow of Walter Gropius. But maybe it's better to be in the shadow of Walter Gropius than to be in the shadow of I don't know who. You could even be in the shadow of yourself. Uh, by the way, of shadow, uh, many years ago, when I was living in New York, I had this strange idea, but it was my uh, middle life crisis. Although I was always in my middle life crisis, even when I was a baby. Uh, but then I had this idea, I was around, around 40 years old. I wanted to, to, to write a screenplay uh, uh, for a film uh, about a man whose shadow follows him, but uh, like uh, half, a, half a meter or, I don't know, 20, 40 centimeters away from his body. Imagine you see a man on the sidewalk with a shadow a little bit distanced from his body, his own shadow. I didn't realize at that time that in fact, my idea was uh, derived from the fact that I was myself divorced from my own soul. In a way, the shadow represents your own soul. I read in a book, um, The Golden Bob, 
uh, by Sir Fraser. Very interesting thing. Uh, in fact, I think in Transylvania, in, in, in old times, it was believed that if you step on the shadow of someone at midday, something bad will happen to that person. So if you hate someone and you, you step on his shadow or her shadow, now I'm, please don't misunderstand me. I don't want you to do this. But that's what I read that if you, that this was the belief that if you stepped on the shadow of someone at midday, it has to be at midday, that person uh, maybe even died the next day or something bad happened to that person. I think it's a metaphor for the fact that the shadow in a way represents the soul of someone and having someone walk like uh, some centimeters, a distance away from his shadow would mean that that person was fractured from his own soul as, as I was then, I think. Anyway, uh, back to the Fagus uh, factory. Uh, it's a plan of the fact of a factory. What what can we do? Nothing really interesting here, but the building looks uh, looks good. I mean, you know, for us we are kind of tired of these kind of buildings because many appear to be kind of like this. But uh, this was uh, more than one hundred years ago. And still, uh, these uh, windows uh, make my day. These little small windows. We don't do any longer too many opening windows. You know, they uh, we rely too much on air conditioning these days when we talk about sustainability. Look at this door. You know, why did they feel the need to do this ornamental work here? Well, because again, you know, ornaments cannot be totally banished from work. That's why. And maybe it's, it's, it's a door without glory, and still it's done in a certain way. It's not a banal door. It's not as complex as the door we saw in that uh, first house that he built together with uh, Walter Gropius that we saw. So the Fagus Werk, uh, the Fagus Factory by Walter Gropius and Adolf Meyer, uh, a detail which shown with, which is um, drawn uh, more recently. The Germans are very good at this. Uh, the Germans and the Japanese in general. They're incredible. Anyway, we saw this. Now the Verbund exhibition from Köln or Cologne, 1914. This is an excellent work. Unfortunately, it lived for only a few months because it was built and then a few months later was destroyed because the First World War started. And it's so very sad. That's when uh, the, the, the Bruno uh, Taut uh, glass pavilion was built too and also destroyed part of the same exhibition uh, backgrounds uh, in, in Köln. So this is the building by Walter Gropius and Adolf Meyer. And it's very sad, it was, it was destroyed. I mean, this stair in the corner, I mean, both, both corners is, is, is beautiful. I mean, you know, uh, uh, IMP did something, uh, you know, not very different in Berlin, uh, not too many years ago. Uh, yes, of course, this glass uh, creates problems, but aesthetically is a very nice uh, uh, staircase. Look at it. 1914, so 107 years ago. Built by Walter Gropius and Adolf Meyer. Adolf Meyer was obviously a very good uh, partner of, uh, of Walter Gropius. This is the ad administrative building. Um, it was also supposed to be an industrial building. It still has a certain, I mean, the symmetry and, uh, you know, it was 1914, just before the First World War started. Still, there are modern elements here that cannot be ignored. And in a way, I like this ambiguity, this hybridity. It is a work which here in the center is not really very modern, or it is, but not to a large extent. But then the corners 
as something else. The glass, of course, is associated in general with modernity, with democracy, transparency, uh, and all the rest. The opaque walls, I mean, this part could have been, uh, you know, part of Beijing or who knows what, uh, even a temple architecture, perhaps, for some, uh, for some countries or religions. Uh, it's a good building. It was a good building. And the only thing we have are these black and white pictures. In 1914, they didn't make uh, probably too many color pictures. Now the Chicago Tribune competition, uh, competition which Walter Gropius lost. And unfortunately, most of the time he's as, um, acknowledged as the author, but he worked together with Adolf Meyer. And as we read at the beginning, uh, he was, he is considered now at least as co was an author of, of, of the project, which didn't win. This was the building, and I, I wouldn't say it was a truly unbelievable building. I mean, yes, modern, maybe for the time rather striking, but there were other projects more striking than his or them or theirs. Well, what can you do? One was famous, the other one was not. Walter Gropius was famous, so he is shown together with his, uh, his tower. Where is Adolf Meyer? Maybe Adolf Meyer at the time when the picture was taken was busy in the office doing other drawings for Walter Gropius. What can you do? The life is not fair. The world is not fair. One works, one takes pictures of himself near the work that uh, was actually not done by him, but by, by the one lab still laboring uh, in the office. Yes, it's an unfair world. What can we do? Well, we should fight against unfairness, but even at this level, I mean, you know, I look at his face, you know, and I'm asking, this man uh, doesn't feel guilt that, uh, you know, the, he certainly didn't do this drawing. I mean, this drawing was done manually and was probably done by Adolf Meyer. And, and he, 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 he is displaying himself here with together with the work as if uh, uh, at least Michelangelo, as far as we know, he was hanging from the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel himself. He painted with his own hands that, you know, but here, um, <laughs> anyway, what can we say? What can we do? The boss is the boss, uh, but the boss didn't win. I mean, you know, these things could have been in many other ways. They did it in this way, and I don't think it's a brilliant tower. Walter Gropius and Adolf Meyer. Now here you see other towers. The first one is by Walter Gropius and Adolf Meyer. I don't know who did this one, but I know who did this one. This was Adolf Loss who made a column, kind of a Doric column, the whole tower, because he was playfully interpreting what a column means for a newspaper, because this tower was supposed to be built for Chicago Tribune. And this was done by uh, Bruno Tau. The tower that won the competition was one on the left, neo-Gothic. I don't know who did this one. I know this was Adolf Loss. I know we know this is Walter Gropius. And this cartoon was done by the uh, graphic artist of the Chicago Tribune, a cartoonist, but uh, more recently, of course. Now this is the house, uh, House am Horn. Uh, I don't know what. This means in German, it was done with George Mücke. Uh, he was an artist and they won a, a kind of a competition within the Bauhaus. And they built this house with a central living room. Um, I don't know, I mean, probably for us today, it's not very impressive. But at that time, uh, and you'll see inside is very modern <laughs> using uh, the new, <clears throat> the newer forms of aesthetics. So I'll read a little bit about this. <clears throat> in 1919, at the time in which Germany was still in upheaval, 
of his defeat in the First World War, the Academy of Fine Arts and School of Applied Arts in Vienna, Germany, were combined to form the first Bauhaus. Its stated goal was to erase the separation that had developed between artists and craftsmen, combining the talents of both occupations in order to achieve a unified architectonic feeling, which they believed that had been lost in the divide. Students of the Bauhaus were to abandon the framework of design standards that has, had been developed by traditional Euro European schools and experiment with natural materials, <clears throat> abstract forms, and their own intuitions. I should have played the, the own intuitions first, but anyway, even at the end, it's good that they are mentioned. Although the school's output was initially expressionist in nature, and we saw that, that house by Adolf Meyer, and there are other proofs, by 1922, it had evolved into something more in line <clears throat> with a rising international style. An exhibition of work produced by the Bauhaus in 1923 perfectly embodied this changing perspective of design. <clears throat> True to the institution's roots, the exhibition was not merely a gallery of objects or images, but an entire house filled with works by Bauhaus students. The House Am Horn, as it was named, was designed by Georg Mücke and Adolf Meyer as a prototype for affordable housing which could be quickly and inexpensively mass produced. The use of experimental building techniques and materials not only helped to achieve this goal, but dovetailed perfectly with the increasing focus on functionalism in the Bauhaus curriculum. Mucke, who was a painter and teacher at the Bauhaus, had already been in the process of designing a house for himself and his wife, when the school announced the competition for a model residence. His winning entry was bold in its simplicity, a square plan with a ring of rooms surrounding a central living room. Each space was designed with an explicit program in mind and intentionally specialized so that it could not be used for any other purpose. Not a very modern idea, I would say, anyway. Aside from the living room, the house comprised a room for the men, a room for the lady, interesting that they had uh, separate rooms for a man and a woman, a room for children, a guest room, dining room, kitchen, and the work niche. This is the project. So the, the living room was in the center, lit uh, here from above uh, this uh, lateral uh, roofing. I don't know who, who did the furniture though. Quite a big radiator, isn't it? And interestingly, it was not placed uh, under the window or near the window, but on the opposite wall. I guess this is the children's room. Unless it is Charles Eames room with its cubes. This is an axonometric <clears throat> drawing of the of the of the house. Somehow the, the, the axonometric the drawing is more interesting than the built house because it has colors and it, it, it has this uh, uh, these uh, transparencies. You know, if you compare the, the axonometric with a building, I think the building, the build building is much more blunt than, uh, than the work, than the drawing. So again, in this case, Adolf Meyer was kind of the second man. But it's very possible he made the building, uh, you know, buildable because uh, Mücke was, was an artist. He didn't know about these things.
interesting bathroom though, because mainly of this light here. And again, the giant radiator. I mean, uh, these people didn't have problems with uh, distributing the heat in the apartment. Here, probably you take a cold bus just because in the room was so hot. I mean, you know, it was probably a very a small room, like a bathroom, you know? I mean, you know, uh, the dimensions were not big, but the radiator is as big as in, in the other spaces. Anyway, it looks like a boring uh, little school or it doesn't look like a home, does it? The kitchen with a little <laughs> Uh, flowing or uh, fluid uh, architecture here, thanks to <laughs> the requirements of this, uh, you know, uh, part of what a sink is. <laughs> it amazes me in a way, that because the most prosaic part of the room is actually also the most interesting uh, visually, you know, or artistically, much more interesting than everything else here. The old and the new, but the new uh, seems kind of uh, you know, blunt, really. Uh, is it a progress from here to here? I love the new. I mean, in the case of Charles Sims' house, case studied one eight, uh, you know, it was a, a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, novelty. But here, I would. <laughs> If you would ask me to choose between these two buildings, forgive my being uh, retrograde uh, or whatever, I would choose this building. I wouldn't choose it this one, I guess, but who knows? Although on this wall you could project at night films by Ingmar Bergman. Okay, and now we arrive at the end of the presentation with four images about the uh, work he did alone. But he died in 1929, so you know, uh, he didn't have too much time to accept himself alone, but he built this building, which I don't know exactly what it is. What can we say? You know, it's, it's okay, I guess, but uh, is it glorious? I, I'm, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> Really, sorry for being honest, but I like this picture here. It's it's well taken, and uh, you know, uh, it's it's a more convincing corner of the building. But as a whole, the building I don't think is uh, it is not a wow building. No, and this is the last picture of the presentation. I think with uh, part of what we see here, probably the most spectacular one is is here. Probably the staircase is here. That's it. So happy birthday, Adolf Meyer, and uh, thank you for being here today. <laughs>